property number one. Are you guys ready for it? It's really a very nice thing that happens. And it happens when we look at the LU decomposition, which you just did on the quiz. And by convention, it is the L matrix that has ones on the diagonal. Why is that the convention? Well, it kind of makes sense because this matrix captures the steps of Gaussian elimination. And when you express the step of adding a multiple of one row to another by an elementary matrix, that elementary matrix has ones on the diagonal. So you put them all together, the resulting matrix has all ones on the diagonal. So by convention, in the LU decomposition, the matrix on the left has all ones on the diagonal. So that's the LU decomposition. But then there is also LDU decomposition, where you say, well, I want this matrix to have ones on the diagonal as well. And that will be LDU decomposition. So where, what is the matrix D? You will say, I see this 4, 9, and 25, how nice that they're squares. That's a coincidence. I, I chose a special matrix for what's coming next, but they won't always be squares. They'll just be whatever numbers, possibly zeros, positive, possibly positive and negative numbers. And you can factor them out into a diagonal matrix D. That's what this matrix D will be. It will have 4, 9, and 25 on the diagonal. And what I want you to do is to use the elementary matrix logic to tell me what will be left of you after you factor out this D. So think of a matrix U so that when you combine them back together, you get this matrix. Yes. Oh, you're doing it. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's see. So when I factor out four, one, one, three halves. What, what Jags is saying is that because this can be thought of as an elementary matrix, acting upon this one from the left, coming from the left, it will do something to its rows. What will it do to its rows? Well, it will multiply the first row by 4. And when it multiplies the first row by 4, the result should be 4, 4, 6. So in this matrix, it should be whatever this row is, divided by 4. So 1, 1, 3 halves. Yeah, I kind of saw a 3 halves before somewhere, didn't I? Right? Okay, so the next one is 9. And the final one is, of course, 25. And let me copy the matrix L from above. Okay, and this is the LDU decomposition. LDU decomposition. Do you notice anything about it? Yes. This matrix and this one are the transposes of each other. That will happen only for symmetric matrices. You end up with L. D, L transpose, L, D, L transpose. Now this goes both ways. If you do this for some matrix and you end up with L, D, L transpose, then you will say, well, clearly this matrix is symmetric. Whenever you end up with this combination, we know from this that the matrix is symmetric. The interesting question is, if you start with a symmetric matrix and you do the LU decomposition and then you do this factoring out of whatever you find on the diagonal, which are pivots, are you guaranteed that this remaining matrix will be to transpose of L? And the answer is yes, you are. And the proof is not so sophisticated. And because it's not so interesting, we're not even going to go over it. But that's what will always happen. It's a little bit magical. But it's also not unexpected at all, because after all, that's what symmetric matrices look like. So this might be called the LDL transpose decomposition. I don't know. That would be a reasonable name for it. But it tells us oh so much about the positive definiteness of the matrix A. In fact, it tells us everything we need to know. It gives us two things. Number one a practical way of assessing positive definiteness. The method that we discovered last time, let me draw it schematically. The method we discovered, we said that a matrix we discovered, uh, didn't really discover it, observed it for a two by two matrix, and then generalized it as if we don't need proofs of things. But we said that if this determinant is positive, 
and this determinant is positive, and this determinant is positive, and the overall determinant is positive, then the matrix is positive definite without ever giving proof. Well, now we're going to give proof. So that's number two. So number one was that this is a practical method. You'll see that in a moment. This is not practical. Nobody calculates determinants by the determinant formula with permutations. The way people evaluate determinants is by doing Gaussian elimination anyway. So this is beautiful theoretically, but practically you're going to do Gaussian elimination like you did anyway. But also, this will be proof of this criterion. And you're about to see. It. Well, first, tell me, is this matrix positive definite? Well, that takes us back to this discussion. Because we have exactly the form B transpose MB. And we only consider this in one direction. I said the matrix M is positive definite is a positive definite. But it really is more. It allows us to relate the properties of M to the properties of A. And here's how you will see it. So number one, first let's acknowledge that this is in, in the form B transpose MB, where this is B and this is B transpose. Of course, right now we're calling this L and then this is the transpose, but we might as well give this matrix a name and then this will be the transpose, right? So it is in the form B transpose MB. So if this matrix is positive definite, then the matrix A is positive definite. Is this matrix positive definite? Yeah, yes. Of course it is. Because if we imagine, let's do a mental exercise. I do not want to write this down. Suppose you were asked, you're not allowed to use this criterion because we're trying to prove this criterion. But if we ask, is this matrix positive definite? Yes. What would you do? You would multiply it by XYZ on the left, transpose XYZ on the right. And you'll end up with 4X squared plus 9Y squared plus 25Z squared. Straight sum of individual squares. Of course it's positive definite. So a diagonal matrix with positive entries on the diagonal is of course positive definite. So we're exactly in the situation that we considered. We have that form with the matrix in the middle, clearly positive definite. This tells us that A is positive definite. Yeah. Let's take a more careful look at it. So what I, I'll just do it over there. Right, you're kind of questioning whether we actually have the strong positive definiteness. You're right to be suspicious of the sentence, straight sum of squares. So we end up with an expression like this. Is this always strictly positive as long as one of x, y, or z is not zero? And the answer is, of course, yes. Because as long as one of them is not zero, boom, that's immediately positivity, and the rest cannot bring it down. Now, the reason you're a little bit wary is because of this. Here's what you kind of remember. That we had, if we had something like this, this looks just as innocent, doesn't it? It's a sum of squares. But in this case, it's not good enough. Because they're not individual squares. They're sort of coupled together. And if we take x equals minus y, then this is 0. And it, you just have to take z equals 0, and now you have only positive semi-definiteness and not positive definiteness. Does that make sense? So just saying it's a sum of squares doesn't cut it for positive definiteness. But I, that's not what I said. I said sum of individual squares, and that does do it. You guys are with me? So we always have to watch out for this subtle case. So back to this. Strictly positive definite matrix in the middle, so the whole combination is positive definite. And let me just tell you that this tells us much more than that. It also tells us when the matrix is definitely not positive definite. For example, if there was a minus sign here, then this would definitely be not a positive definite matrix. 
Why? Because there would be a square with a minus sign in front of it. And of course you can find a way to make it so that that's the only term that matters. So this matrix has to be positive definite. In other words, all of these values on the diagonal have to be positive for the matrix to be positive definite. And if one of them is zero, then it's only positive semi-definite. And if one of them is negative, then it's definitely not positive definite or even positive semi-definite. Okay. And from this, two criteria follow. I'll mention this one second. This will be second. But first is that when you do Gaussian elimination and all of the pivots that you encounter are positive, then the matrix is positive definite, right? Because these are, after all, are just the pivots that you encountered in the course of Gaussian elimination. That's kind of nice, isn't it? So that's probably possibly the most practical criterion. Okay, that's number one. I, I kind of don't have anything else to say about it, even though that's exactly what you would do. If you were given a thousand by a thousand symmetric matrix and you wanted to see whether it's positive or definite, you will just start doing Gaussian elimination and as soon as you get a negative pivot, you'll quit because the matrix is not positive definite. Simple. If you get a zero, you might have to continue to see if it's maybe still semi-definite. Okay, but as long as you get it. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, it actually totally proves this criterion. Because let's think about, you'll see it in a moment. What is this entry? It's just that entry, that's a good answer. But you will also see that it's the product of this matrix, this matrix, and this matrix, right? That gives you four. And then you'll think about what's the, what is this two by two submatrix? And if you really have to look closely at how numbers interact within these matrices. If these matrices were full, were not triangular, then I couldn't make the statement that I'm about to make. But for triangular matrices, because of all of these zeros, it's actually true that this two by two submatrix right here is this submatrix times this submatrix times this submatrix. Once again, it would not be true if there were non-zero entries here. Because these non-zero entries would pull in stuff from the third column and the third row. But because of those zeros, you just have to see it for yourself. It's actually true. And then finally, you know, you can see that it keeps marching like that. Very good. Now, let's ask, what are the determinants of these sub-matrices, diagonals on the diagonal? I think they're called principles. Principal submatrices, maybe principal determinants. It's these determinants centered on the diagonal. Well, everything here will have the determinant of one. Are you guys with me? It's a triangular matrix with ones on the diagonals. Yes, same thing here. So each one of these determinants will just equal these determinants. That's all. And so if all of these numbers are positive, then this one by one determinant is positive, this two by two determinant is positive, this three by three determinant is positive, and so forth. So this decomposition reveals everything. And that's all you need to know. And so we have just discovered one more criterion and proved the criterion that we stated before. And I have to admit to you, when I first learned of this, I thought that the proof would be extremely complicated. The, not the proof. We really didn't give a proof because there are some things that we just said, yeah, it works like that without proof. But the insight into why this works like the way it does uh, seems so sophisticated, but it's actually quite clear. Okay? And so this is called, this process, it's called quadratic form diagonalization. Diagonalization of a quadratic form. Because if you use this matrix, right, if we were to multiply this by x, y, z, what will happen? x, y, z, when, you, when I multiply these two matrices together, well, the first entry will be x plus y plus 3 halves z. I'll give that a new name. The second entry will be y plus z. 
and the third entry will be z. I'll give them new names, a1, a2, a3. And then here I will get a1, a2, a3, but as a row. And what will be left of the entire quadratic form will be just the diagonal matrix. 4a1 squared plus 9a2 squared plus 25a3 uh, squared. And that quadratic form is, is diagonal. Only pure sum of squares. So one topic that we haven't yet discussed, another topic that I'd love to have time to discuss, is change of basis. What this insight does is welcome a change of basis with respect to which the form will be diagonal, just the sum of squares. Okay. One thing you might be suspicious of, you might say that if I actually wrote this as the straight sum of squares, but in terms of x, y, and z, we will find ourselves in this situation, right, because one of them will be x plus y plus 3 half z squared. And you will say, but hey, that's not good enough for positive definiteness. That's only good enough for positive semi-definiteness. A little bit of a contradiction, right? So I won't answer it now. I'll let you think about it. Why not? Why is it there's something a little bit special about the combination that you'll have that will actually not pose this problem where you just have to be crafty enough about the right combination of x, y, and z to make one of these zero and then make it semi-definite. It won't, you won't be able to do it. It will be a sum of squares more special than this. You'll see. There'll be one element that's more special than this. Okay, one other thing that I want to mention about this is Koleski decomposition. Koleski decomposition. I won't write it down, I'll just mention to you what it is. What I can do here is take the square root of this matrix. I can write this matrix, this Koleski decomposition, should write it down. Koleski decomposition only works for positive definite matrices where you get positive numbers here. When you get positive numbers here, you can kind of take the square root of this matrix. Think of it as 2, 3, 5. And then think of this matrix as 2, 3, 5 on the diagonal times another matrix that's 2, 3, 5. Make sense? And then you would take one of these matrix and absorb them into this matrix. And the other one of these matrices and absorb it into this. So you kind of take this, write it as two square roots and one of square root goes here and one square root goes here. And you end up with just L, L transpose, where it's a different L, where it's the L that has the square root of the pivot in it. So typically, you have square roots in the Koleski decomposition. Okay? So that's just something you should know. Very useful decomposition, but really just half a step away from LD, L transpose. 